السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعليه وصحبه أجمعين I could listen to that recitation all day I, uh, that was a very inspiring, inspiring beginning to the day and it's in the beginning that I want to start my talk and that is the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so what I'd like to do uh, because I I have about 40 minutes for my talk, and instead of talking for 40 minutes, I wanted to break it into about a 20-minute presentation, and then 20 minutes for question and answer. So uh, I wanted to start with the family values as expressed in the, in the biography of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then uh, talk about uh, a few uh, segments of the society, the individual, the spousal relation, the uh, relation uh, with one's uh, uh, children and extended family, and then, of course, the neighbors. And I realized that the other speakers today will be t touching on each of those in greater depth, but I just wanted to, uh, as, a, as an opening presentation, give a broad framework for which we can look at each of those uh, aspects of family values. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, lived at a time in which the central structure for society was not the individual, as it is in some modern societies in which we might be living today, nor was it um, the family, but it was the tribe. The tribe was the central uh, aspect of the society. If you did not belong to a tribe in his day, in that environment, in that society, you, you would not survive. And the tribal structure wasn't all familially linked. In other words, people belonged to the tribe who were slaves of the tribe, who were adopted into the tribe. And the tribal structure was somewhat complex, and it was also stratified, meaning that there, were different, there was a hierarchy within the tribal structure. And the tribal structure had many advantages from a sociological point of view. In other words, in this harsh environment in the desert, um, with scarce resources, belonging to a tribe was really a matter of survival, and that's why you couldn't survive on your own. And the tribal structure had uh, a give and take. It had tribal leaders that maybe had um, authority, greater authority than other members of the tribe, but their authority was kept in check by other members of the tribe who, uh, let's say when the tribe were to engage in warfare and and acquire some, some wealth as a result of that engagement, then they would have to distribute in some kind of fashion to the rest of the tribe. And it wouldn't necessarily be egalitarian, but it would, they would be uh, pressured by, by the society, by the, the members of their tribe, to uh, conduct themselves in a relatively fair fashion. The problem with the tribal structure is that um, the, the, each tribe was almost like a nation into itself, with its own ruler. And uh, as each of the tribes was jockeying for the resources of society, uh, oftentimes these tribes came into conflict with one another. And it was, it was a common practice at the time of the Prophet for tribes to, to raid one another's uh, property, their caravans, etc. And if uh, God forbid, they're, uh, they're, they're in the course of this uh, raiding, they're, they're, um, a, a death occurs, then there develops the cycle of violence that uh, can be very tragic. This was the case at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. For we see when in his time, the, uh, and I'm not going to go over his entire biography, but I just want to highlight one aspect, which was the, 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 the small village of Yathrib. He was born, of course, into the city of Mecca, but to the north of Mecca, there was a small uh, city of Yathrib, which later became known as Al Medina, as we all know. Uh, and there were two tribes, there were many tribes there, but two major Arab tribes there, the Aus and the Khazraj. And they had fallen into a feud and a cycle of violence where one side would uh, attack and, and the other side would respond, and vice versa, and they had developed sort of entrenched camps. So it was in the course of his preaching his me message in Mecca where uh, some members who had been fed up with all of this feuding, they saw in the person of the Prophet Muhammad and in the message of the Prophet Muhammad 
salvation for their own village. And they invited him to come to Yathrib to lead them out of this cycle of violence and this feud that they had been in. And so when they approached him, at first it was a young, young man who then went, uh, at the, the next year he came back, they came for successive years, a larger and larger group. The first time it was a young man, the second time it was a group uh, from one of the clans, and then the, the third year it was members from both clans. And they met at this, uh, of course, at the, at the, the meeting point was Aqaba, and there was the famous uh, oath of Aqaba that occurred there when about 70 plus of the members of the two tribes came and they said, we will give you protection and that of your followers. And they invited him to, make, to, to visit, to uh, move to um, Yathrib in the Hijra, and of course, this is what happened. And when he got there, when he arrived after the whole ordeal and the assassination attempt and the circuitous route that, she, that he took, he finally arrived and he made a speech. He made a speech, the first words that he said, he arrived in, uh, of course, Quebec, and he said, it's a very short speech, only three things. He said, number one, he said, maintain your family. This is now, he's establishing for the first time in Medina, the ummah, the community. This was such an important point in the, in the history of Islam that this is the beginning date of the Hijri calendar. It's called the Hijri calendar. Why did it not start when he first received wahi? When he first received revelation? Why did it not start on his birthday? Why did it not start on his, the date of his death? It started on the day of Hijra because the date of Hijra is the foundation of the community. And so when he arrived, his speech was very short, and he started by saying, do not cut family ties. Do not cut family ties, number one. Number two, he said, feed those who are hungry. And he said, number three, he said, pray at night when other people are sleeping. This is the foundation of the societal value or the family value that we find in Islam. These three things. Number one, do not cut family relations. Now, um, I'm not going to go through a, a great amount of detail because I want to cover some other things, but suffice it to say that in the course of his establishing the community in Medina, he changed the focus from the tribe to the family. And, uh, but even with regards to the tribe or the extended family, uncles, aunts, you know, not just the tribe, but your extended family, which is a smaller unit than the tribe at, as a, at, at large. Do not cut family relations. Maintain your family relations. Now, I start with this as a, as a premise for, fam for family values. Because we are not individuals, and we are not just the nuclear family. We are extended families, and it's important when we inter interact and engage with one another, that we have certain limits that we do not cross. And one of them is the cutting of family ties. Now this is something that we could spend the, the entire day on because, let me just see a raise of hand. Does anyone know, now of course not yourselves, but anyone know of someone who's cut off relations with anyone in their family? Raise your hand, I wanna see a raise of hands. All right, everyone. Uh, it can get very ugly. They, they, I'm never going to speak to that person again. They could be brothers. They could be cousins. You know, s sisters. Um, you know, it, it can be very unfortunate that that un even till today we're not honor honoring the legacy of the prophet, and we will cut ties. But this is what he said. Number one, do not cut family ties. Number two, he said, feed those who are hungry. Now, this is a family value as well, because in order for society, in order for our community to be stable, we can't have those who have and those who have not. And I'm going to talk at the end about neighbors, but feed those who are hungry. This is a basic premise so that there is a, a, a degree of, of stability, that there is a, a, a sense of bonding between the various aspects of the society. And number three, he said, Pray when other people are sleeping. Now, this was important because, of course, in the time before the Hijra, there were no perks to becoming a Muslim in a material sense. If you became Muslim and followed the Prophet before the Hijra, you're setting yourself up for ridicule. You might incur a tremendous financial uh, loss because of the, 
there was boycotting, there was uh, discrimination and, and bigotry against Muslims for the 13 years or so that the Prophet was in, uh, was in Mecca. So to, be, to become Muslim before the Hijra, you, there's really no material gain. It's, there's a beautiful gain, it's a spiritual gain and a closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and following the truth. But there is really no hypocrisy in the first, in the, in the first instance of Islam. But after the Hijra, what quickly happened is that the Prophet, peace be upon him, was looked to as the leader. He was like the mayor of the city. And people started embracing Islam in mass to, be, to, to follow the rising star and to follow the, the, the momentum. And so there were, from the beginning, hypocrites. From the beginning of his uh, stay in Medina, people who joined, but half-heartedly or insincerely because they, they, wanted to, they didn't want to openly oppose someone who was so popular so maybe they followed and then tried to uh, create discord. So in order to try and, from the root, try and address this concern, he instructed the people from the very first speech, pray when other people are sleeping. Because in doing so, if maybe you yourself had a bit of insincerity, insincerity in your heart, or if you had some conflict of interest, or if you had some uncertainty, by making that extra effort and connecting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that doesn't involve other people looking at you and other people uh, and, and you possibly doing things with the intention of gaining a positive reputation in the eyes of other people, but you're sincere. You're praying when everyone else is asleep and there's no other motivation behind that besides drawing close unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the foundations of, of a society and these are individual values, family values and societal values. And um, I want to talk for a minute about the individual, starting with this idea of praying uh, when other people are asleep. The trajectory, the psychological trajectory of a human being is that we start out dependent. We are dependent on our, on our parents. We're dependent on, on them for, our, for our every aspect of our existence, from eating and being, being bathed and being educated, etc. We rely fully on our, on our families. And so education uh, for the individual, our, our, we start out dependent, rather, on our families from the beginning. But as we mature, we move to a stage of independence. This is the human trajectory. If we are well uh, raised, we will become eventually independent. But this is not the pinnacle of our trajectory. If we are part of a society and a community, our independence will allow us and enable us to come to a place where we can become interdependent. We can become interdependent, and this is, in, of course, the form of a spousal relationship, a husband and wife. So this works at the level of the individual, where individually we are dependent, independent, and then interdependent, but then also interdependence is a sign of a healthy and mature community where the families then become interwoven in an interdependent relationship in the workings of the community, in the, in the forming of the activities of the mosque, putting on events like this. Uh, I'm sure those who put on the event, no one says, I did this all myself. There was a uh, tremendous amount of uh, volunteerism and interdependence and consultation, etc. So at the individual level, it should be our goal to mature, to have a sense of identity of who we are, what it is that we're about, and know, uh, ha have confidence in, those are my little girls in the back making no noise there, speaking about family values. <laughs> yeah, Habibati. All right, so, uh, so we should have a sense of who we are, to know what we want. Sometimes when uh, marriages fall apart, uh, and the couple was young when they got married, sometimes you hear them say, well, I didn't really know who I was. I didn't know what I was looking for in, in my spouse. I didn't know what I wanted in life. So it's, it's important that as individuals we mature fully before we engage in an interdependent relationship. And some people mature at a younger age and some at an older age. But this is an, in, an important aspect of, of one's uh, development. When it comes to the spouse and uh, the, the Honorable uh, Sayyid Qazwini will be uh, 
speaking uh, in more depth about this, but I'll just say that there is a, a connection between the, the individual and the spouse in this regard. People say, well, how do I, what do I look for in, the, in my spouse? What, are, what, are, what's, what is the, I, how, how do I know that I'm marrying the right person? And I always say that there are three things to look for in your spouse to, to know that you have found the right one. The first one, the first one is to know how that person treats their family. To know how they treat their family. Are they the kind of person who avoids dealing with their family and, and, and doesn't spend time with them, who doesn't, uh, is not honorable and respectful to their parents? How do they treat their family? In other words, you know, are they, are they a good sibling? Do they help their younger sibling? Are they respectful to their older sibling? Not only how do they treat their family in the good times, but how do they treat their family in the bad times? And this is a hard thing to know when you're looking for a spouse, but probably the most important question. How do they engage with their family when they are angry? Do they slam the door to their bedroom and cut off ties and stop talking? Do they, uh, God forbid, curse or throw things? Do they give the silent treatment? Do they yell and scream? You know, what is the way in which they engage their family when things are difficult, when they are, time, when they are tired, when they are hungry, when they're frustrated, when, when their parents might be unreasonable, not that that ever happens. Uh, but how is it that, you know, their, how is their character during those times? Because that is, my dear brothers and sisters, how they're going to treat you as a spouse. So that's number one. The second thing is, um, how is it that they um, uh, how is it that they spend their free time? Do they spend their free time in studying, in going to the masjid, in growing in their character, in attending halaqa, in memorizing the Quran, in uh, in learning and growing, etc.? Or do they spend their free time chatting online or just wasting their time playing video games all the time, whatever? How is it that they spend their free time? This says volumes about someone's character. And the third thing is, who do they spend their time with, their free time with? With which friends? Because, you know, as the Arab uh, 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 method goes, um, you know the man by his, by his friends, all right? Or you know the person by his uh, acquaintances or her acquaintances. So those are the th the third one's probably the easiest to find out about someone else. And you can't ask someone, oh, how do you treat your family when you're angry? Oh, I smile. You know, it's not, you're not going to get, the people present themselves either consciously or, or subconsciously in the best, they put the best foot forward. Uh, but these are important things to find out one way or another. And if you're part of community, you might have an opportunity to know that. But if you're not engaged in community and you are simply an island unto yourself, then you aren't going to find out those things about your spouse, and it'll be a big surprise after the, after the, the wedding. Uh, but I always say, you know, people are so keen looking outside. What am I looking for in the other? But those same three things, before you go and look for someone else, look in the mirror. You say, what, how do I treat my family? What are the, what are the ways in which, you know, how would I characterize my, my relationship with my parents, with my siblings? Am I respectful? Am I someone who is, is happy to spend time with my family or do I try and avoid them? Am I helpful to my siblings? What's that relationship like? How do I uh, respond to my parents when, when we're disagree in a disagreement? How do I engage in conflict and then resolve the conflict? Is it something that's long and drawn out? Is it very dramatic? Is there a lot of drama going on in your household? Or is it something that you've learned how to uh, deal with in a way that's respectful and that doesn't escalate the conflict? And who do you hang out with? How do you spend your free time? These are important questions to ask about your, in the, yourself as an individual. The, the third uh, aspect, so moving from the individual to the spouse to the children now, uh, the, things of, the thing about the children, I mean, there's different phases in, and, uh, for each of the, the ages of the children. Of course, when they start out small, uh, the issue is oftentimes of discipline. How do you discipline them? How do, when they disbehave? 
Is there name calling? I mean, this is, you know, in some, some families, this is, a, you know, an inherited trait. You use uh, different animal names to refer to your children at times. You know what I'm talking about. So, uh, you know, how is it that we discipline? Do we put time out? Is there spanking involved? Is there not? How is it that you discipline? And the word, I use the word discipline and not punish because the word discipline comes from the word disciple, means to follow. So how do you then model the behavior? And how do you then uh, help the child to develop good character without an authoritar authoritarian uh, fear hanging over them? Because if you can inspire the child to be, um, you know, to act within certain limits, not out of fear of the, of the consequence and the punishment, but um, out of a sense of uh, sort of an internal sense of knowing what is right, it takes a lot of patience sometimes. It takes you longer to, let's say, uh, prepare and get out of the house or to, to accomplish things. But if you're able to uh, help your child to follow the instructions and to, uh, uh, to behave correctly without yourself losing your temper, without yourself displaying anger, then you've accomplished a great deal. At the next stage, of course, you know, they start developing friends. And it's important at this stage that your home become the hub and the central location for your friend, for your, your children and, your, and their friends that, to uh, assemble. So uh, it's important that you know your children's friends. And this is particularly important once they become teenagers. At the earliest stages, there's a, a pie chart. Uh, imagine a pie chart. At the earliest stages, the pie chart is filled in with their awe and respect for you as a father or a mother. And you are their ho wholly their influence. Unless they have siblings, then they take a piece of that pie as well. But for the most part, as parents, you have the biggest chunk of that influence. Uh, as they start going to school, teachers take a big chunk of that as well. Hopefully you have good teachers at wherever you send your, your children to school. And then, when they become older, the parents' uh, influence wanes to just a small sliver. The teachers even shrinks. And most of that pie chart is filled with the influence of their friends. Now, I know so many people that says, oh, I don't want my, my child hanging out with, uh, you know, an American or this or that or the, you know, non-Muslims. I want them to hang out with Muslim or with Arab or with uh, other Iranians, etc. The problem is... Uh, sometimes we don't vet the friends. They say as long as they're under this rubric, then they'll be fine. Sometimes those friends are worse than a, a, a non-Muslim with good character. And we, and we, 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 we kind of uh, become lazy in our parenting, and we kind of rely on the community to raise their child, but we haven't vetted who their friends are and what kind of an influence they, are, they have on, the, on, our, on our children. And so it's extremely important that the, the criteria for choosing a friend is not whether they're Muslim or not Muslim or from this uh, national origin or not, but what is their character? And I know so many successful, believing uh, youngsters who are strengthened in their faith by having as their friends faithful Christians or Jews as their close friends who allow them to express their identity as Muslims and respect that and also are respectful of the identity of their friends. Oftentimes what people do in this day and age in high school, at the high school uh, level, is that they will uh, conceal their own identity. Mo, Muhammad becomes Mo, you know, et cetera. You kind of lose your, your, your identifying name, any other features that you may have, you just kind of uh, shun that and you, you try and blend in. And so when you have a group of friends, people are so eager to, be, to fit in that they try and conceal their Islamic part of their identity. And sometimes they not just conceal it, but they, go, they act counter to it. They'll drink alcohol, they'll uh, do drugs, smoke pot, they'll go to parties, they'll date girls, or they'll date boys. So the problem, the problem is that people will compromise their identity because they're trying to fit in with a certain group of friends that would not respect them for who they are. and so. It's important that you help them identify what a true friend is. A true friend is someone who uh, will encourage you to be a better person and not 
force you to conform in order to be accepted. And this can cross, like I said, national uh, uh, boundaries of national origin or of ethnicity or of religion. Um, so friendship is an important part of uh, parenting. And that some things you can do is to invite the, the, the people over, <laughs> know the children, know their parents, visit them at their homes, and really determine whether they're sound friends, and then help your children walk through the process of identifying friends. And again, this could be in a whole seminar on, on uh, high school age identity. I've spent the last uh, seven and a half years leading the youth group at the Islamic Center of Southern California. And so this is a major topic. This is probably, you know, I would say the most important decision in your life is who you're going to marry. But the, the most important decision before that decision is who's going to be your friend. And people don't really think in a, in a concerted fashion about who they choose as their friends. They just, if you tell a teenager, who did you choose as your friends? They say, I didn't, you know, I just, I'm friends with this person. How'd you become friends? Uh, we were in class together, or it's kind of a random thing. I said, did you decide to be that person's friend? They said, well, no. People don't want to go and say, will you be my friend? And then face the opportunity, you know, they'll look like a nerd, and then they'll get rejected anyway. And so, you know, no one's going to do that. But if you help them without going through that awkwardness of trying to figure out who is of good enough character to be your friend because you deserve to have a good friend, and then how to go about making friends with someone who you want to, to be your friend. There's actually a process you can go through steps to, to do it in a, in a, in a natural way. Um, so most people are not considered about how they do that, and if they happen to fall into the wrong crowd, that's what they say, they happen to fall into the wrong crowd. Well, that's how friends are made in high school, and they can really change the trajectory of their faith and of their values. Um, but I would say that in order to maintain a good uh, family uh, environment in which values can be expressed, there are three main things to focus on. And I'm going to stop my comments um, after uh, this comment and the, and the one on neighbors. The three things is it's important for you to have open communication, that they are not intimidated to share with you not only the good things, but even the, their shortcomings, their faults, their problems, their difficulties, the challenges that they face. If they, if they feel that you have an open mind and an open ear, then they will communicate with you. And they will share with you, and by doing so, you will have the opportunity to influence them. But if you have become so rigid in your parenting that they're, oh, my parents are unreasonable, I can't talk to them, then they're going to go talk and get advice from someone who probably wouldn't give as good advice. So it's important to maintain open communication. And the way you can do that is start when they're small. Number one is that you would uh, at the, have family meals together with the TV turned off. With the TV turned off. Off the TV, all right. And you, and you have a discussion. You have a discussion around the table. How was your day? Now, if you ask a ch child in, let's say, middle school, high school, how was, what did you study today? Uh, nothing. Uh, right? So you don't ask that question. That question is not on the table. What is on the table? What was the most exciting thing that happened to you today? Oh, yeah, I remember when we were playing at the, in, this, in the playground, et cetera. OK, what was the worst thing that happened to you? Oh, when you know, the teacher said this or did that or whatever. You get specific answers. But what did you study? I don't know. You know, you're not going to get, and then you get frustrated, then you just like, forget it, turn the TV on, right? No, don't do that. All right. So have a conversation and, and, and make this a ritual, the family meal. You sit together, and I know sometimes parents are busy and they can't do it. This is, if you want to have family values, have a family meal every day, at least one. Preferably breakfast and dinner, if at all possible. Sit together and have that time together as a family in which you guys communicate about anything and everything. Number two, pray together. Now, this is challenging sometimes when the kids start getting, in, uh, getting into uh, high school or they get lazy or they you know, they're, are waffling in their practice, etc. But make prayer not an obligation that is burdensome, but make it something that they look forward to. And you do it a number of ways. Number one, you just kind of you never get angry around prayer time. You don't yell, come to prayer, right? It's not that you're, you're undermining the whole experience. You can't pressure the kids in, in with you know, that kind of force. 
you, you, you make it as, this is what we do. We're just going to do the prayer, all right? And you don't take no for an answer, but you don't yell and get angry and lose your temper about prayer. You know what I'm talking about, right? All right, so you don't do that. But instead, it's much more constructive to figure out how to, after the prayer, and this is, this is, these are a couple of, of suggestions. Um, after the prayer, instead of doing a memorized dua that the imam would, would lead, have each person make a dua in their own words. Something, and the way we do it in our family is, for the, when they're, starting from when they're young, make a dua, say three things, or two things. Something that you're grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, and something that you want. That's it. And, and so it's not memorized. They have to come up with something every day, something that they have to think, something that they're grateful for, something that they want from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So everyone takes turn and they make dua. And it doesn't have to be a memorized anything from the Prophet. You want it to be from their heart. They're learning to communicate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also they should learn from you. You should, as the one who's the, the adult, when you make your dua, don't just also, you can say memorize dua and the one that you've... Uh, that are modeled after the dua of the Prophet, etc. But then also say, Oh Allah, help me as a parent to be more patient. Help me as a, as a parent to not lose my temper. Help me to be forgiving. Help me to be more gentle. Help me to be kind. Help me to, to spend more time with my family. Help, so that they see that you're asking for, from Allah for something that you need. And they, you model for them that, that value. And this is, a, this is a way to pass on faith from one gener generation to the next, that you open up your heart. Because if everything is just wrote in an Arabic, if it's, that's not the way that they think, if that's not the language in which they think or the way that they express themselves, then they're going to uh, miss out on seeing how it is that you connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the third thing is, um, uh, so prayer, meals, and open communication. Those are the three things. And lastly, I'm going to stop here is the issue of uh, the family values that involve your engagement with community and neighbors. Now, I'm gonna, uh, I was going to say a, few more, a little bit more on this, but I'll just uh, uh, share with you one, one thought. The neighbors and your engagement, first of all, there's a report that the Prophet said, your neighbors are 40 houses on either side. So you have a big sense of community. And there were so many obligations that we as, Muslim have, as Muslims have towards our neighbors to the point where some of the companions of the Prophet complained. They said, what, they're going to inherit from us next? I mean, there were so many things. They thought they were going to be included in inheritance. So, so the, uh, the idea is that we have to be uh, inclusive of our neighbors and engaged in our community and be thoughtful of them, make sure that if they are hungry, we feed them, that their concerns are our concerns and that we should be known by our neighbors. Sometimes neighbors are like little feuds. It's like, oh, this neighbor and that neighbor, the tree, and this. Don't only get to know your neighbor when the tree hangs over or when the garbage is this or that, but get to be proactive. Get to know your neighbor, be generous, be gracious, and don't be petty when it comes to neighborly relations because this is one of our huge family values in Islam. I thank you very much for your attention, and I might be out of time, but if there's... Uh, Chance for questions, I could take a couple. Yes. Jazakumullah khair, assalamu alaikum.